Okay, class. Um, I think I'm all set up for this lecture. So I'll make sure that my drawing utensil works. Okay, perfect. So let's erase this magically. Okay, so uh, welcome to Genetics Bio 240. Uh, like I said, my Zoom lectures got uh, deleted totally on me. But anyway, it is what it is. So I'm going to redo this lecture. And so let's start off by, I like to start off my classes by talking about what exactly we're going to study. So um, like if you were taking biology, I would say, well, we're studying bios, which is life and ology, which is the study. So we're, we're studying life, right? So then I would want you to define what life is. Um, if I was teaching anatomy, which I would never do, um, I would have wanted to define it as ana means up and tomi means to cut. So anatomy would be to cut up. And that's what I would expect to do in anatomy. So here we're studying genetics. And genetics is the study of the transfer and the regulation, right, of heritable information, which you can read out the slide. But essentially that means is that uh, what's passed on, right, and how that's regulated. So are your genes turned on or off? Uh, how is it inherited from your mother versus your father? Um, and what can influence uh, those genes, whether it's external mutations or epigenetics, which we'll cover in this class as well. So just to remember some definitions here, right? Um, heredity is basically the similarity between parents and offspring. So if you had a, a, a goose and it laid goose eggs, it would have geese babies. It wouldn't have duck babies. Uh, same thing with elephants, dogs, and of course the bushes. <coughs> okay. Next slide. So there is variation between uh, heredity, right? Like the bushes don't look identical. The brothers don't look identical. Um, if we look at flowers, they can be the same species, but different colors. Um, humans have, there's at least three genes that we know of that control skin color. And that's not including albinism, which is shown here. Um, you got, I mean, we all know there's different colored peppers. You just gotta go to the store. Uh, there's different banding patterns on uh, the same species of snails, depending on what their uh, heritable variation is. Um, and then again, this is these are corn snakes, so uh, some of these are amelanistic, melanistic, anatheristic. Uh, these are terms just describing uh, missing certain colors, so reds, oranges, or all colors, right? And then you'd have an albino uh, corn snake. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, heritable information and how that's passed on and how that varies uh, in populations and individuals. All right. So the next slide. So there's different levels that geneticists look at things. Um, we have molecular genetics, which is the study of like what it sounds like um, molecular level things like we're talking DNA and RNA. And that's how we're going to start off this class. So I think for me, and maybe I'm just biased since uh, I have a PhD in molecular and cellular biology and biochemistry, I'm probably biased to molecular. Um, but I think it's easier for me to understand what's going on if I understand it from a molecular level up rather than, uh, and, and maybe that makes me a reductionist. It probably does. Um, so a reductionist would be someone that, uh, looks at a plane and says, I can understand how that plane works by looking at all its parts. And a holist would be like, well, you're never going to understand how it flies because you don't know how it interacts with the environment. So a plane wouldn't fly unless there is air to have different speeds across its wings above and below to give it lift. Um, so anyway, with that said, we're going to start in molecular genetics, but, um, 
And then transmission genetics, which is uh, how things are transmitted uh, and sometimes we refer to that as classical genetics or Mendelian genetics. So, um, like if you had two fruit flies and you mated them together, uh, and they had one had white eyes and one had red eyes, what kind of offspring would you get? And what would be the ratios and stuff like that? And hopefully you've already learned this in bio 181. Um, so a lot of it's going to be review, but we're going to get into some pretty hardcore, uh, probability and statistics. So there's going to be some math involved in this uh, as well. And I think that's one reason that people have difficulty in um, my batteries about the die. So we're going to plug this in. Uh, in this class, is because of the math. And it's pretty math intensive because there's a lot of statistics involved. Um, where can I put this? I'm going to pause this for a second so I can find a plug. Where is the cursor? There you are. Okay, sorry about that. So now I have power and my computer is not going to die. Um, it's been quite a week. Anyway, so transmission genetics is we're going to look at how things are transmitted from uh, parent to offspring. And, um, Again, that's like classical genetics. I put some notes down here at the bottom. You can also read this. And then population genetics. So population genetics is the study of populations, um, as the name implies. And so we can apply certain things to populations as opposed to individuals. And we can make inferences uh, as well. So, um, and then there's other things that we're going to also go over, which is... Um, quantitative genetics which is a way to sort of uh, quantify things that are hard to quantify like we just talked about there's variation in heredity so let's say if you're a farmer um, you would use quantitative genetics to try to figure out if you bred two big chickens together would they have big chickens or would it not matter right like if you had you know if the data suggested that it didn't matter what size a chicken was because it's just a random chance the uh, of what genetics is going to be passed on or the size or maybe it's just the environment then you wouldn't really care if your chickens big chickens bred with big chickens and little chickens bred with little chickens you just let them all breed and it wouldn't you wouldn't care but if you want to have bigger eggs maybe that's a uh, uh, heritable uh, variability so you would breed big chicken, chickens with big eggs with uh, other chickens that had big eggs, which probably isn't a good analogy. But anyway, I think you get the drift. <laughs> okay, so let's see. And then we'll look at developmental genetics as well. So there's going to be uh, different levels of genetic analysis that we'll do in this class. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start a, a little bit about... Uh, Molecular genetics, so hopefully you remember this from 181. So molecular genetics is the uh, DNA and RNA, the, the code that underlines the genes that produce the proteins that make you what you are. So you guys probably all remember, and this slide is all screwed up because it's all squished down, but... You remember that DNA is a double helix, right? And A pairs with T and G pairs with C, hopefully. Um, and only one of those strands is going to be converted into messenger RNA, which is shown here. And then that messenger RNA is going to be converted into a protein. So a lot of this is hopefully going to be reviewed for you. Um, if not, you're going to have some extra studying you need to do to probably go over Campbell's chapter 17. Uh, but this is uh, what uh, Francis Crick, uh, uh, was it Watson or Crick? I think, uh, I think it was Watson actually, 
who uh, coined the central dogma of molecular biology that says that DNA is turned into RNA and RNA is turned into protein. Okay, transmission genetics is just the passing of DNA from one generation to the next, right? And so one of the good examples is if you look at labs. Um, so Labrador Retrievers, you probably know, come in three flavors, right? They're, they're uh, black labs or they're brown labs or they're yellow labs. And so the question might be, how could you have two black lab parents that have all black lab puppies and you could have two black lab parents that have uh, litters of black, brown, and yellow. And how's that work? And what can you expect? So if you're a dog breeder, you might want to know that. Uh, you might want to be able to predict, like, you know, I'm going to have this. These parents are going to have, you know, three, four yellow labs and three brown ones and nine uh, black ones statistically. So you might want to be able to predict that, or they're not going to have any. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't want to offer up uh, yellow lab pups if you knew that your, the parents were going to have yellow labs. So dog breeders, farmers, things like this are super interested in, and geneticists are interested in what the statistical outcome of two uh, of a breeding will occur. And even humans might want to know this. You might want to know, well, I'm a carrier of the cystic fibrosis gene. Should I be concerned? Uh, my mate we're going to have kids with, are our kids going to have cystic fibrosis? Um, and there are, you know, jobs that you can do, like genetic counseling, too. So you also, um, pedigrees are an important part of transmission genetics as well. Um, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but... Um, the breast cancer gene, the BRCA1 gene, was actually discovered by a nurse who noticed that her family had a high rate of breast cancer. And so she constructed a pedigree which showed the transmission of that gene, the breast cancer gene, from one generation to the other fairly clearly. And she wasn't a geneticist. She just did a pedigree um, analysis on it. And that's the person who discovered that gene, not the gene itself, but discovered that there was a genetic component to it. All right. So, um, during development, right, your genetic information that's in your DNA, right? Like, like all of your code of life is written in your DNA. And that code is turned into proteins. And we'll talk about, well, will remind you how that happens and then those proteins are turned into cells and then those cells interact to make you know an organ like the brain for example so during development this this genetic information is is uh, made into super complex phenotypes uh, like the brain for example from a code of four letters which is pretty amazing um, so we're going to look about look at how this happens how DNA is made into proteins and that how those proteins uh, form cells and how those cells uh, form our organ system. I mean, if you think about it, like if you just had a bunch of genetic information and you had all the information you needed to make a human being, even if you had that, how would you tell the cells that are supposed to be a foot to be different than the cells that were supposed to be in your head. And that's a super important question for developmental geneticists. Um, and we know the outcome by doing a bunch of experiments on fruit flies, Drosophila. All right. So there is cl uh, classical forward genetic analysis where uh, basically you uh, take an organism that you're interested in that uh, you're not going to get a lot of flack from doing weird things to like fruit flies for example fruit, fruit flies are a great uh, genetic tool and that's uh, Drosophila and that's why uh, we know a lot about their genetics 
they have a very short uh, life cycle so they can go from larva to mature adult in five days and have offspring so you don't have to wait around a lot like if you were experimenting with humans it might take you you know 20 years before you would have your next generation and that's not a very good model for a geneticist you want something that's fast breeding has a lot of offsprings so that you can get good statistical probability of having one of these mutants so we're going to talk about how for genetics works we're going to talk about uh, things you can do to mutate genes and specifically what we're going to mutate so we could tell if we're going to turn an a into a c or a g by what chemical we use and i'm going to teach you that in this class as well so uh classically you would take some fruit flies you would feed them some mutagen um, and we'll talk about all kinds of different ones uh, it could be a random mutagen it could be something that you know that's going to change a purine to a pyrimidine or something like that and if you don't know what that is um, we'll discuss that again in the first lecture uh, or you could just expose it to radiation just you know open some uranium or whatever x-rays and just x-ray the hell out of it and then let it have offspring and see what happens so in this case uh in this example you have a mutant that's that it's called eyeless it's not really eyeless it just has a really small eye um you know uh, drosophila geneticists are pretty funny in their nomenclature and how they name things so you get a mutant that comes out from this radiation or whatever you fed whatever mutagen you fed it and then you do a cross with a regular wild type drosophila so this is a normal eye um, and you find out that all of the offspring have normal eyes right so uh, when you do that you're going to do some uh, back breeding and I'll we'll talk about why that happens because you can purify lines by doing that if you keep crossing it back to the parents and I'll show you statistically um, how that happens over the course of the class but that's what geneticists do so they just keep back breeding it to the parent mutant until they get a pure line of mutants and then when they do that they can look at the difference between the mutant strain DNA and the normal DNA and they'll come up with a DNA sequence and we'll talk about how you do this uh, with uh, for genetic analysis and then once they find that sequence they'll map that sequence to a specific chromosome in this case the example is drosophila chromosome number four and then uh, these are all centimorgan units that we will use to uh, tell and I'll show you how to do this as well during the class how we can map that to a chromosome at a specific location and hopefully in 181 you learn that uh, locus which is short for you guessed it location um, is what the term we use uh, where that particular DNA sequence or gene is located on a chromosome so that's for genetic analysis you introduce a mutagen you get a random mutation you go fishing on an expedition to figure out where that mutation occurred in the DNA and where that's located on the chromosome and you can do this with simple crossing techniques and we're going to learn that um, and that's that's in uh, transmission genetics all right so we're going to look at how a single cell can become a complex adult right I mean hopefully you guys learned this in 181 but I'll remind you again that when you are a fertilized egg in your mother's womb you are a single set of genetic instructions right so one cell you have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes 46 chromosomes and that genetic information is gonna make you right from your mom and your dad but here's the question is how do your arms know where to go right if the cell has only one set of instructions and all those sets of instructions are passed on to all the other daughter cells right through mitosis then how does it know where to put your eyes or where to put your feet or where to put your toenails right and so if you wanted to ask a question 
what came first, the chicken or the egg, I 100% would tell you that it's got to be the chicken. Because the egg, the single fertilized egg, would not have a direction. It wouldn't know up from down, left from right. It wouldn't know where to put an arm or an eye or an ear or anything. And so it would come out with body parts all over the place. Two heads, uh, 17 feet. Um, that's because we know from genetics that there are nurse cells that direct the direction of gene expression in the cells that come from the original fertilized egg or the zygote. And so that it's kind of fascinating, but that branch of genetics is called developmental genetics. Um, and it's super important. It also plays a very extremely important role in cancer research, which I do. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, during development, the cells from, in humans, the cells from the fertilized egg, from the embryo, become implanted and form the placenta. So those cells invade the mom cells because they're not her cells, right? They're her bi biological child cells, invade her placenta and grow into it. So the placenta is only the child cells, and that's how we can use placental cells for uh, embryonic stem cell research. But it's fascinating because that is kind of how cancer progresses, and so there's a lot of research into how this developmental uh, biology or genetics occurs uh, when doing research into cancer treatments and cancer cures. All right, so, and... If we look at um, genetics across species, we can see, and you probably heard this, you know, we're, we share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees and 95% with gorillas and, you know, 50% with C. elegans, which is a, you know, a 200 plus cell worm. Um, we can look at the variation in DNA and get a pretty clear picture of who's related to who. I mean, it's, it's not that complicated. You guys probably know if you sent your DNA into Ancestry or 23andMe that they would take your DNA and they would sequence it or they would they do something called the SNP analysis and we'll talk about what that is later on. And they're going to there, you might get a hit, like my wife did it, and she got a hit on someone who was really close to her, right? Like, it said that they were uh, cousins. And so she came to me, and she's like, what is going on here? And so it turns out that her father had, or her, gr wait, gr her grandfather was a traveling salesman, had an affair, had a child, put it up for adoption, never told anyone. And so she matched with someone in Canada, uh, and it turned out it was her great aunt, not her, uh, a cousin of hers, or, sorry, uh, second cousin, I guess. Um, I think they shared 25 or 12.5% DNA or something like that. Anyway, the point is, is that you, you know that the closer your DNA is related to someone else, the sequence, the A, G, C's, and T's, the more closely related you are to them. And all of these sites like that do ancestry and stuff like that, that's what they're looking at, how closely your DNA matches. So we can look at not only just in within humans, but we can use look across species and see how close our DNA is to say frogs or fruit flies or flatworms or whatever and so at some point um, and this is quite fascinating at some point there is a common ancestor where we shared all of our genetic information and we branched from um, and that's really not in dispute uh, Every living thing uses DNA, and it, there's a really good evidence that the first life on Earth has the same DNA that 
every living thing on earth has. And there's some pretty wild theories of like panspermia where um, the earth was seeded by DNA or organisms by an alien race. Uh, I'm not, I don't, not, I'm not convinced that's true. Uh, but there is uh, quite a bit of evidence that we're all related in some way. So in this case, Paris Hilton would be also related to a fruit fly because they share a common ancestor. So they're probably 10 millionth cousins once removed. And I did a lot of research as uh, for my master's and my um, PhD on the relatedness. I was, I was interested in the relatedness of tortoises, the, all of the world's land tortoises. And I got into a big fight uh, over the, with uh, with some geologists over the data that I generated from my master's thesis. So what I did was I was do, I was taking the DNA from all these different tortoises in the Galapagos Islands in South America, and one of the questions was is that where did these Galapagos tortoises come from? Did, because the Galapagos Islands were at this time presumed to be roughly a million years old. And so they had to come from somewhere. Like the tortoises can't just swim out there. They would drown or die uh, before they made it. So uh, they probably floated there. But where, where did they float from? So did they float from Chile? Did they float from uh, Peru? Did they float from... Ecuador, like, you know, wh like, where did they come from? And so I sequenced all the DNA. And uh, just like we know from between humans, uh, the closer the DNA is to two species of the same organism, and they're in a genus called Giacciolone, the more related they are. So my data showed that there's a tortoise from Chile called Giacciolone chilensis and that is the closest living ancestor to the living Galapagos tortoises. So I wrote a paper, published that paper, and that was really not the dispute. But what I did was something called molecular clocking, which not only tells you how they're related, but how long ago they are related. It's kind of like if you looked at ancestry and you know who's your great 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 grandmother on their based on their percent DNA versus your uh, grandmother or your mother or whatever. And so I got into it with some geologists that told me that the Galapagos Islands were only a billion years old. And so this is called molecular clocking, and we'll talk about how we do this. I created a molecular clock for tortoises, and that data showed that those tortoises split off three million years ago. So I published that data, and I took a lot of flack for that. Uh, I had people in lectures uh, at the ichthyologist and herpetologist uh, national conference in New Orleans uh say this is bullshit and walk out on me uh, but in the end i was saved because there's geological evidence uh, that the Galapagos islands have risen and sank many times over the past three to four million years and so it looks like the the dna you guys probably know dna doesn't lie and it shows that the dna evidence supports the, the Galapagos Islands and the geological evidence that the Galapagos Islands are about uh, three to four million years old. So that's pretty cool. Actually, I mean, if you think about it, like I figured this out just from the DNA of some living tortoises uh, that they couldn't figure out for hundreds of years studying all these uh, rock formations and different things. And so DNA is pretty powerful. You can do a lot of uh, cool uh, ancestry things with it, including uh, how old uh, organisms are and how long ago they split off. All right. 
All right, so uh, we look at genes. Humans and flies inherited the this PAC6 uh, gene from a common ancestor. The mutations in that rec uh, prevent normal eye development. So we share an eye gene, a developmental eye gene called PAC6 with f flies, right? The genes are the same. Uh, neither one of us would be able to develop uh, our eyes properly. And this is part of that eyeless thing. Um, without that gene. Uh, in genetics, we can do selective breeding of crops. We can call that artificial selection. So um, if you look at something like corn, corn, um, when the pilgrims came here, was not the same corn that we eat out of the can that says sweet corn. Their corn was more like feed corn. So... Um, So if you look at a corn kernel, it may look something like this, right? And so let's say that uh, part of this is protein. This tip is going to be carbs, right? The sugars. And this part is going to be protein, right? And everybody knows that protein bars generally taste like dirt so the corn uh when the pilgrims were here for thanksgiving that was mostly protein right so it didn't taste very sweet today we would call that feed corn uh, but through selective breeding right by picking the sweet corn and breeding with other sweet corn, it looks more like this. So this is now the carbs, which are a lot, there's a lot more carbs in it. And this is the protein. So there's a lot less protein. And that's what makes the corn taste sweet. So that's the difference between sweet corn and feed corn. And this came about through selective breeding over the past few hundred years uh, to select the sweetest corn of the crop. Uh, same thing with dogs. All dogs came from wolves, right? So man selectively bred those. Chihuahuas look nothing like wolves. Great Danes look nothing like wolves. Um, we can artificially modify genes. Um, and I'll show you how that we do, we do that as well in this class. So, um, we can take the genes from uh, certain bacteria. So there are bacteria that live in the soil and they cause insects guts to rupture when they consume them. The, uh, the gene for that has been taken out and put into plants, corn and things like that. You would call that a genetically modified. So it's, it's BT, that's the bacteria, uh, its initials. And uh, so that gene has been put into corn. And if corn borers or things like that eat the corn, that gene causes the cells in their stomach to rupture and leak. And then they can't maintain uh, pH and then they end up dying. So basically it's a toxin. It doesn't affect humans. Um, so that's why you can eat it. It only affects insects because of the its method of functioning. Oh, here it is. It's bacillus. Here it is. <clears throat> Wrong. Thing. So it's right here. Um, that's the bacteria, and we we just say it's BT for short. Um. Yeah. So this is a regular plant. This is one infected with. Uh, BT, and then uh, now the corn borer eats it and dies. And we've done the same thing with papayas, right? So papayas uh, had a, a viral infection. Um, and so uh, genetically modified genes to resist that were introduced into papayas. And so I would... 
guess that there is not a single wild existing papaya on this planet that is not genetically modified. And even if they tell you that it's non-GMO papaya, uh, I am 99.9% .9 sure that if you tested that papaya, you would find that it's genetically modified. Um, and same thing with uh, Roundup, Roundup resistance. And we'll talk about that later on. So we can take genes because the genetic code is universal. We can take genes from a salmon and put it in strawberries and then the strawberries will be resistant to freezing, right? Because if you ever took a strawberry and put it in the freezer, it forms ice crystals which break open the cells and make it mushy. So if you could inhibit the formation of those ice crystals, we do that when we're freezing like embryos and stuff like that. We use special chemicals that inhibit ice crystal formation. Um, this is a naturally occurring thing in salmon, which the FDA is a lot more likely to approve if it's something naturally occurring. Like if you ate salmon, chances are you're, unless you're allergic to salmon, you're not going to have an allergy to a salmon gene in a, a strawberry. So anyway, that, that's what they use is these naturally occurring things to modify, uh, and, there's a lot of cool things that have been done with this. We, we can, uh, back in the day, um, if you if you were a diabetic, you needed insulin. The only place to get it was from pigs or cadavers, right? Now, uh, Genentech, which stock symbol is just happens to be DNA. I think that's kind of funny. Um, they were the first ones to introduce a, a human gene into a bacteria that produced insulin and they marketed it as Umulin. There are better insulins out there now um, as time progressed. Like that's one of the experiments that I did at the VA was looking at different variations of the structure of the protein insulin to see which one is delivered better, which one lasts longer and so on and so forth to help uh, people with diabetes. <coughs> All right. So anyway, we can take any gene out of any, organism and put it in any organism and it will read it just like its own right it's not because every thing every protein is made the same way um which is different than like human language you couldn't take one language and just put it in another and say oh i know what that that means dog um but in genetics you can't and that's why there's a, a good reasonable uh, idea that we have a common ancestor. Okay, so there are many heritable conditions that are medically significant, right? Um, a lot of these are like Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease um, is a dominant trait. That means if you have one instance of this gene that you will get the disease, uh, which is opposed to recessive, where if you have one uh, instance of this gene, remember you guys, you have two chromosomes for every trait, uh, every gene, right? One you got from your mom and one you got from your dad. So we're what we call diploid. Hopefully that's uh, just a review. Um, and so if you had one copy of Huntington's, either you got it from your mom or you got it from your dad, you're going to get Huntington's. Um, and if that's true, then you would know that your sisters and your brothers would also get it. Um, which is different than recessive genes, right? If you have one copy of a recessive gene, like if you had one copy of the recessive breast cancer gene, that wouldn't affect you. You need two copies uh, that are defective to increase your risk of breast cancer. Um which is on next on the list, right? So breast cancer, BRCA1, with a BRCA2. There's lots of genes that we've discovered that are involved in breast cancer. taste Sachs disease. Um, this is uh, a disease that causes uh, the lys lysosome. So hopefully you learned that in 181. A lysosome is what breaks down things in cells. Uh, it, it has the enzymes proteases and lipases and things like that 
And so in this disease, the, the, a lipase, an uh, enzyme that breaks down lipids in the lysosome is not functioning. So the cells get clogged with these um, fats and that causes uh, the disease to uh, occur. So uh, it's a pretty nasty disease. It's kind of similar to Alzheimer's. Um, usually not survivable. Uh, usually these children die a pretty horrible death uh, by the age of two or so. And I'm sure that there's lots of videos on the internet about this if you want to research it more. PKU, uh, fetal ketouremia. So this is a disease that's pretty, pretty rare, but easily treatable. And um, I don't know if you know this, but in Arizona and many states, uh, if you have a child, uh, they do test it for some genetic variants. And one of the tests they do here in Arizona is a PKU test. And the reason they do that is because in PKU, you have a, a mutation in your enzymatic pathway that converts phenylalanine into tyrosine. And because of that, you get a buildup of phenylalanine, which is broken down into a toxic substance. And I'm not going to get into the details of it in the intro, but the easiest way to prevent these terrible toxic side effects of PKU is to simply not feed or allow the, the baby to ingest phenylalanine because if there's no phenylalanine, then it can't get uh, built up or regulate phenylalanine, I should say, because you're going to need some phenylalanine. And then there's polydactyly, which are, these things are, um, the genetics of this can get complicated, right? So, and it will, we'll cover polydactyly, um, and then pseudochondroplasia, which is also a dominant, uh, trait that causes what many would call dwarfism. It's kind of interesting. So there, so because it's dominant, right? Um, you just need one copy of the gene. And so if you usually, I, uh, one copy is the most common form of, uh, to get, uh, uh, pseudochondroplasia. So they're both heterozygotes. So you can imagine if you have two heterozygotes and hopefully this is review. And if not, you can do uh, this Punnett square on your own. So you have two heterozygotes, right? And they mate. So you have two uh, people with dwarfism. They mate. They're going to have offspring. So the three out of four chances they're going to have uh, an offspring with pseudochondroplasia. And then one out of four chance that they would have a normal height offspring, right? A homozygous recessive offspring. Um, there are some documented court cases where uh, parents who have dwarfism didn't want to have a child that had normal height. And so they genetically screened uh, their embryos. They did in vitro fertilization, screened the embryos, and then selectively implanted only embryos that carried the gene for uh, pseudochondroplasia and the offspring found out about this and not only sued his parents but sued the doctor that did it and won so you kind of got to be careful with this uh, messing around genetics uh, at times all right where are we okay i think this is slide 15 i can't see because the numbers are covered by the border of this recorder. All right. So we already talked about the definition of a gene. So a gene is a, a, a region of DNA 
uh, that is passed on from one generation to another. We're going to talk about the parts of a gene, right? But a gene generally codes for a protein. It doesn't have to. Um, you probably learned about transfer RNA or ribosomal RNA in Bio 181 or intro bio. And so those code for RNAs, not proteins. They're still considered genes, right? But generally when we talk about genes, we're talking about a unit of DNA that codes for a product that's a protein and that protein is going to fold into a certain shape and that shape is going to dictate its function. Okay. So this is back to a little bit of classical Mendelian genetics. Um, we're not going to get into two complex things. I'm just going to talk a little bit about Mendelian genetics. This should be a review um, and some uh, exceptions to Mendel's rules. So back in the day, people um, believed that when two people had offspring, their traits blended together. And that's uh, how transmission of heritable uh, information occurred and they called it the blending theory of inheritance the lots of people bought into this but there is a, a monk named Gregor Mendel and he questioned this um, I think he kind of thought about it as like okay if I have all these colors and I mix them together I get that disgusting brown color right and so if that were true, if blending theory was true, then eventually everyone would look the same. They're all going to blend together. Um, and he didn't really see that happening. So he kind of questioned this. Um, and he lived his life. His parents wanted him to be a doctor. He's like, eh, I don't want to do that. Uh, so he went to school. He studied um, biology. He studied math which made him really good at, at genetics right he's the father of genetics um he he was also really into botany and so he was interested in what caused variation in plants he at at some point after he had gone to school you know it's in the area of the czech republic uh and and now austria he went to the university of vienna I'm not going to test you on any of this stuff. I'm just kind of telling a story. So Gregor Mendel, um, he taught at uh, what what's called the Brunn Modern School after he graduated from college. And he lived in a local monastery. And he asked the monks, he's like, hey, guys, um, I'm kind of interested in doing this plant breeding experiment. Can I plant some peas in your garden? And they were like, yeah, cool, no problem. So this is the garden, actual photograph of Mendel's garden where he planted the plants. And Mendel was like, hmm, I, I got a problem here because, you know, the wind's blowing around and pollen's going to fly from one plant to another. And so I got to th really think about what kind of plant I'm going to use here. And he decided on the pea plant because he knew from his botany that that peas have both male and female parts, and not only that, but they're covered. So in nature, unless something really crazy happened, like it got hit by a hurricane, a pea plant would just self-fertilize, right? And it's just happy doing that because it has both male and female parts. And Gregor Mendel knew that he could also mechanically interfere with this so he could mechanically cross pollinate plants but there wouldn't just be pollen flying all over the place because that would be a terribly controlled experiment and he was a scientist and he knew this so that's why he picked pea plants and you know this is the 1800s he didn't do anything special they had stores back then you probably watched little house on the prairie so you know he'd go to the general store and 
just like you go to Walmart and there would be packets of seeds. And he was like, okay, well, I'm going to buy, you know, there were pictures on it. People drew on the packets of seeds, but you know, he would buy a packet of seed that had pictures or drawings of purple flowers. And he said, okay, well, if I buy these purple flower drawing seed packet and I plant it, I would expect all the seeds to come up purple, which they did. And he said, and I've, and they also sold white pea flowers at the local store. And he's thought to himself, if I buy these and plant these, they should all come up white. And that's what we call true breeding, right? That means that from one generation to the next, they have the same trait, right? They're purebred, true bred. So Mendel did that. He bought some purple flowered pea plants and some white flower, flowered, flowered pea plants. And he planted them in his garden. And then he went around and started messing with them. So he, you can take uh, some hemostats and a paintbrush and stuff like that. You know, this was available. They still had, they had medicine back then and doctors and hemostats and paintbrushes. And he could take some pollen off of, say, the purple flower plant and put it on the white plant. And now he's crossed the purple with the white. And that wouldn't normally happen, right? Because this part covers up the pea plants so that they their pollen isn't just flying all over the place. So he could do a controlled experiment. He knew what plants were interbred with what plants. And so when he did this and he planted... Uh, the offspring, so the offspring of this, this white plant would have peas, you know, you've looked at peas before they come in a pod, and these pea plants, he would open the pod, plant the plants, and he would call this the first uh, generation, or the first familial generation, we call it the F1 generation, and what he noticed was, is that in this F1, so P is parental, the purple and white, and in the F1 generation, all the plants came up purple. And so he was like, well, that's weird. What happened to white, right? Like most of us would ask that. And so he, he knew, I mean, you probably heard your grandparents say, oh, that trait, that redheaded trait skips a generation or whatever. Um, so he knew that there was something going on between two generations, right? Sometimes the trait would come back, uh, that went away. And so he decided to extend his experiment to a second generation. We call that the F2 or second familial generation. So here's the F1. All the plants were purple, right? And then he crossed these with each other. So he crossed F1s with other F1s, same method, and lo and behold, here comes white, right? But it, it was weird because the white plants always came out in a certain ratio. It was, it was really close to three to one, right? No matter what he did. Um, and so he started, he started naming this stuff. And what he said was, is that, the gene that went away in the F1 generation is the recessive gene. Again, this is, should be a review. And the gene that was present in the F1, in this case purple, that was dominant. And then he started talking about methods to, to name this. So we still use this. So purple starts with the P. So we use the big P to represent the dominant trait, which is purple. And we use little p, sometimes these are hard to distinguish, uh, for the recessive trait, which is white. So this can get a little confusing, but uh, it's actually better to do it this way than to make it p and w. That is even more confusing. So um, anyway, I don't, I'm not going to spoil this or whatever, but this would be dominant and this would be recessive anyway so that's what Mendel said and 
what turns out is that we have the parental generation. So this is not purple or whatever. This is the parental. You kind of think of it as your grandparents. And then F1 would be your parents. So this is the first generation. And then F2 would be the second generation. So this is you. Then this would be your parents. And this would be your grandparents. All right. So <coughs> what he noticed was is that if he inbred these, right, crossbred them, so sibling to sibling, that in the F2 generation, he always got a 3 to 1 ratio, right? And so in, in genetics, I'll, I'll tell you, all scientists are lazy. That's why scientific notation was invented. So we don't we don't do like three fourths and one fourth because you don't really need to write the four because you know three plus one is four. So when we do ratios, you just have to add up all the numbers in the ratio, and that tells you what the fraction is. So we're gonna do some other stuff that's gonna be like a nine to three to three to one ratio. Well, you add all those up. And that's 16. So it's 9 sixteenths and 3 sixteenths and 3 sixteenths and 1 sixteenth. But nobody wants to write all that out. So we don't do that. So that's how we come up with the ratios. All right. All right. So Mendel didn't stop there. He was like, all right, well, maybe I'm onto something. This is weird. He's done this experiment a few times. Still comes up with the 3 to 1 ratio, pretty close, 3.15. And so he starts messing with other stuff. Okay, I'm going to go to the store. I got some flowers that, that flower at the bottom of the plant, some that flower at the top. So we call it axial or terminal. Um, we have some plants that, so axial or terminal. Um, he counted about a 1,000 of these F2 plants. This is the ratio he got. He counted about, you know, close to a thousand of the axial terminal seeds, about the same, about 3.14 to 1. Um, he counted a, a little over 8,000 seeds, yellow and green seeds. And this got a lot closer to that 3 to 1 ratio. And, you know, this makes sense, right? If you, if you think about it, if I tossed a coin twice and it came up heads both times, would you be convinced that it's always going to come up heads? Probably not, right? Because you would think there's a tail and a head. If I cost the coin 10 times and it came up heads 10 times, you'd be that would be a little more sus, right? And if I did it a thousand times, well, that's just like super highly improbable. So the more you do, the closer it should come to your expected outcome. And we're going to look at this in genetics because it's all about what we expect and what we observe. And that helps us determine the mode of inheritance. So these numbers are important. Men, the more Mendel counted, the bigger the numbers, the closer it is to this 3 to 1 ratio, right? So anyway, he did a bunch of stuff. And it all came out the same. So he's like, I'm on to something. He wrote a paper and it was summarily forgotten and lost. And it wasn't rediscovered until the 1900s. And that's when he got credit for figuring this out. So after Mendel did this, he said, no, there's something weird going on here. I don't know exactly what it is. So he just called it a particulate mechanism of inheritance. We know that it's it's genes, right? And and if we look at it like on a chromosomal level, we have two chromosomes. We have one chromosome from mom and one from dad. And on that the location, the locus, is it gonna be a gene? And that in this case, this gene could be for purple, right? Which means basically the DNA makes a protein that folds into a shape that transmits light in the purple wavelength, if you know anything about science. Uh, 
and that's why it looks purple, right? In this case, this would code for white, which really isn't white. It's more what we call a default, right? So uh, if you move into a new house, what color would the walls be? White, right? Because that's the color of the drywall. So um, if you did nothing, that would be the outcome. You might not know this, but in humans, eye color, everyone's eyes are blue. So if you went and had all the pigment erased out of your eyes, guess what color your eyes would be? Blue. And you can do this if you have like $5,000. Someone will do it for you. So you want to have blue eyes? Just run, don't walk, and have all the pigment erased out of your eyes, and you'll have blue eyes. All right. So anyway... I'm going to show you this. So this is gene is broken, right? Maybe it has a mutation in here. The protein doesn't fold into the right shape. Maybe it doesn't fold at all. Maybe it gets degraded. Maybe it doesn't even get made. So whatever it is, it's not purple, right? And not purple by default means it is white, right? So when we're writing this out, all we're going to do is use letters to represent these chromosomes. So in the case that we just talked about, the parents, remember he bought the seeds, they're true breeding. So the purple ones are going to have both chromosomes are going to be for purple pigment that's going to make purple. And he went to the store and he bought the white one, right? And remember, white is a broken, it's not purple, it's default is white. So he crossed the purple plant to the white plant. And you know from mitosis that only one of these traits is passed on into a sperm or an egg in a sex cell. And so this parent can only pass on purple. And this parent can only pass on white. So all the offspring are going to have one purple and one white, right? Now think about this. If you went to Home Depot and you moved into your house and the walls were white and you wanted to paint them purple, and you bought a gallon of paint, which is more than enough to paint your wall, uh, and you painted it all, it would be purple, right? So that's the equivalent of one gene functioning. Now let's say that they had a sale, uh, buy two gallons, or buy one gallon and get one free. So you got two gallons, but you got to use the same color. Okay, so now you got two gallons of purple. Well, I don't know, maybe you don't want to store it. So if you put both gallons of purple on your wall, same color, would it be any more, we're not talking about crappy paint, right? We're talking good paint. Would it be any more or less purple? And the answer is no. It would be the same color, right? So it doesn't matter if you have one gallon of purple, one chromosome of purple, or two gallons of purple, two chromosomes of purple, you're still going to get purple. And so in this case, all these offspring, even though there's only one purple allele, an allele is an alternative form of a gene, right? So I hate to throw these words out here, but I just did it. Um, like, okay, so the gene would be hair color, but the alternative forms of that gene might be red or black or blonde or whatever. So that's what I mean when I say allele. So in this case, there's two alleles, two alternative forms of the gene. The gene here we're talking about is flower color. The allele that we're talking about is either purple or or white, which is broken purple. So here we have one one purple allele, one white allele. We're going to get purple, right? And that's why, so this is the parental generation. This is the F1 generation. I know I'm writing this backwards. And then, uh, then these crossbred, right? So all the offspring have to be big P, little p, right? That's just representing one white and one purple chromosome. They can only pass on one, right? So now we're going to get into st some statistics, and that's where the Punnett square comes in. So uh, the, let's just say that this is mom, so she would make one egg for this, uh, one egg for this, right? So we'll say this is mom, mom, and this is dad, symbol for dad, male symbol. Uh, this is dad sperm, Right, any sperm could fertilize any egg. So this sperm fertilizes this egg. What do we get? Big P, big P. This sperm fertilizes this egg. 
What do we get? Big P, little p. This sperm fertilizes this egg. What do we get? Little p, big P. This, fertile, this sperm fertilizes this egg. What do we get? Little p, little p. Right? So, how many of these are purple? Well, the probability is, just like Mendel predicted, three-fourths will be purple, and one-fourth, this one, would be white. This is the F2. And so this is how Mendel came up with this particular mechanism of inheritance, which we now call, uh, her these heritable units we now call genes, and I put them in quotations because they're really alleles. But I'll let you use the word gene, even though it drives me nuts. <clears throat> because the gene is the trait, right? Not the variation of the trait. Like eye color is a gene, not green eye. That's not a gene. Uh, anyway, I'm going to let it go. So, uh, all right. So, so Mendel, uh, came up with this hypothesis. He wrote it in this paper. It was lost and forgotten, and then it was rediscovered. So uh, the alternative forms of genes, right, the DNA, right, the, that's responsible for the inherited characteristics are called alleles. An allele is an alternative form of a gene. So the gene would be eye color. The alleles would be green, blue, brown, hazel, whatever. Uh, the gene would be hair color. The alleles would be red, black, blonde, brown, whatever. Um, and so the location is called the locus, right? And it's always the, at the same position on the same chromosome. There are some weird stuff where chromosome breakages occur. And we'll talk about that when we talk about chromosomal abnormalities. But for the most part, they're in the same location on the same chromosome. So if you were to look at humans, and I don't know this, I'm just making it up, but let's say that uh, the hair color is located on chromosome number one at, you know, Cinder Morgan 22 or whatever, then it would be at the same location for both mom and from dad. And we would call that the locus, no matter what it is. So in this case, this is the allele for purple flowers. This is the allele for white flowers. Um, together, what would this offspring be? It would be purple, right? Because it's not really allele for white. It's a allele for no color. It's a default allele. There's no like fight going on inside the cell and uh, purple beat up white or anything like that. It's just uh, that that's the default color. And you only need one copy of it to make you that color. <clears throat> All right. So terms. These terms you probably, hopefully, remember from uh, mitosis and meiosis. So when we talk about uh, chromosomes that are similar, not the same, right? This is different. This is purple and this is white. So the DNA, the A, G, C's, and T's are going to be different on this chromosome versus this chromosome. They're called homologous right chromosomes so this would be like a chromosome that you got from mom versus a chromosome that you got from dad right one might have blue eyes one the blue eye allele one might have the brown eye allele uh or whatever different they can they're different um we remember that term because we also use a term called sister chromatids and I'm going to cover this again, but these are exactly identical. So when we're talking about a sister chromatid, it's a copy of a chromosome, and it's an exact copy. So if one, in a sister chromatid, if one is blue allele, the other one is going to be a blue allele, right? If one is a brown allele, the other one's going to be a brown allele. So when we use terminology, we use homologous versus sister. And when we use terminology for genes, we use genes and alleles and remember the position term is locus so put those on note, note cards whatever you need to do in a crossword puzzle remember those terms they're important uh, in in genetics all right 
So Mendel's uh, hypothesized uh, that if two alleles are different, one's fully expressed. He called that dominant. The other one's mask, which is recessive. Now, we're going to talk about exceptions, but in, in Mendel's world, and most of the things that Mendel did, there was a default pathway. So you had a purple gene and a broken purple gene, right? You had an axial gene and a broken axial gene. You had a, a green gene and a broken green gene. Uh, now we're going to get into st statistics, right? And, and I wonder if it say that on that slide, let me back up, right? So remember we were doing this sperm and egg right here. So there's, there's two, um, they're going to be made, right? So, um, from this parent, there's two eggs, right? So what's the probability that this egg is going to be made? Uh, it's one half, right? Because there's, it's like a coin. One half, one half. Heads or tails. Same thing here. So let's, I'm going to do a Punnett square just to show this example. And we'll come back to a Punnett square later. But, so basically we have on one side, we have mom, right? And mom is big P, little p. So she's going to make gametes. She's going to make eggs. And there's a 50% chance, one half, that she would make the big P egg. And then there's a 50% chance she would make the little P egg. And then again, we could do it on this side for dad because he's also big P, little P. And so there's a 50% chance that dad would make the sperm. One half, 50%. And then there's a 50% chance that dad would make the little p sperm, one half, right? And so any sperm has equal probability of fertilizing any egg. This isn't 100% true because uh, the Y chromosome is smaller, so it can swim faster. So there's more of a probability of that happening than not. But for the most case, it's identical, right? very small fluctuation. Maybe if you had a, a million offspring, you would see a variation. So it's close enough. We're just going to call it half. Now, there's a one half chance of this being made and a one half chance of this getting made. So if the chances of this sperm fertilizing this egg is the, the product of the probabilities. One half times one half, which is one fourth. So there's a one quarter chance this offspring is made. Same thing here, one half times one half. Again, this is one quarter, right? Half times a half. Again, this is also one quarter. This is also one quarter. So all of these are all one quarter. And this is called the rule of multiplication. In statistics we can multiply these events uh, together because they're not exclusive events um, now we can also do the rule of addition because these are the same right so we can add the 1 4 chance of this happening to the 1 4 chance of this happening and we get 2 fourths which is 1 half so there's a 1 half chance that we're gonna get big P little p a 1 4 chance that we'll get big P, big P, and a 1 4 chance that we'll get little P, little P, which is different. This is what we call the genotype versus the phenotype, which is purple or white. All right, so let's go back. And talk about this. So, so again, just like I showed you, there's a 50% chance that the gamete is going to receive either the dominant or the recessive allele. And because of this, uh, there's there's a random probability that any one of those alleles would segregate, be segregated into a sex cell, a gamete. That's called the law of segregation. And Mendel came up with that law of segregation. So, 
I mean, basically, it's I don't need to talk about this anymore. All right. So the term, the genetic terms we're going to use, homozygous, right? That means you have homo is same, zygote is a fertilized egg. That means that since all of your DNA, all of the cells that come from that fertilized egg uh, have the same genetic makeup, they're all the same. So you just refer to the zygote, the original fertilized egg, to talk about the DNA of every cell in that organism. So homozygote means it has the same uh, genetic makeup. So in this case, it could be big P, big P. That's homozygote because this is the zygote, the fertilized egg. It can also be little p, little p, because that is also a homozygote, right? So both of those are homozygous. So we have to distinguish this one from this one. And to do that, we just call this one homozygous recessive because it, it contains the recessive allele, homozygous, so both are recessive. And this one we can call homozygous dominant because it contains both dominant alleles, right? And that means they both code for purple flowers if it's dominant, and then the, both alleles code for white flowers if it's recessive. Heterozygo, hetero means different, zygo, zygous, fertilized egg. So that means it's going to be one of each, big P, little p, right? The phenotype for this is purple, right? This one's white. This one is purple. I'm sorry. I'm kind of improvising here because my microphone kind of jacked on, uh, got jacked up on me uh, in my office. So I'm using my laptop um, and my writing pad is not uh, as compatible. Anyway, let's carry on. All right. So we can predict inheritance by using the Punnett square, uh, just like I showed you. So all the Punnett square is doing is instead of drawing you know okay we have this sperm and this uh, sperm and this egg and this egg and then we have all these uh, okay this sperm can fertilize this egg and this sperm can fertilize this egg and this you know the foil method for math the Punnett square just kind of cleans that up right and so all we're doing is we're putting the gametes uh, on each of the in the X and Y axis right so this is the eggs and this is the sperm. I will put tails on it just so you remember that. And so obviously this came from dad and this came from mom. And so this is the probable outcome. Now, Punnett square, this is relatively easy. Punnett squares can get useful uh, when it gets big, right? Because if we're doing two traits, then this square is going to have four outcomes on each side. So that's going to be a 16 square Punnett square. And if we have uh, three traits, so like P color, P height, P uh, shape, wrinkled or what, then you the, that is, uh, so to figure out how many gametes you have, you just put it to the nth power. So uh, two to the nth number of traits, in this case, to the first would mean you'd have two variations of gametes, right? Because there's only one trait. If we had two traits, it would be two to the nth, which is two squared, which is four, which means we'd have four different out. This is for heterozygotes, by the way, uh, not homozygotes, because you can only have one. Anyway, so this is like a like hybrid crosses. So if we have two traits, like let's say P color and P height, which we're assuming is one gene, then you would have four possible combinations of gametes, <coughs> different gametes. If we did three, that's two to the third. <coughs> I need some water. I left my water in the lab, outside of the lab. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. This is like an hour and 20 minute lecture, so you're probably sick of hearing my voice anyway. So that's two times two times two, which is eight. So that means my Punnett square would be eight by eight, which would be a 64 square Punnett square. And then if we had four traits, then it's 60, uh, instead of 64, it's 
2 times 2 times 2, which is 4, 8, 16, and that would be a 16 by 16 Punnett square. And so what is that, 256? And so, like, you know, there's 20,000 different genes in the human body. So imagine that you have to do a Punnett square that's uh, 2 to the 20,000th power. That would take forever. I, like, I don't even know if a super supercomputer could do it in a week. Uh, but I guarantee you, you as a geneticist couldn't do it in your whole lifetime. So this could get really complicated really fast. Um, I'm not going to make it terribly complicated, but you should be able to do it out to at least three traits. So that would be a tri-hybrid cross. Anyway, and I'll teach you shortcuts so you don't have to do a whole Punnett square if it's like super complicated. So hopefully everybody gets the Punnett square and the different terms that we covered. And let's see. Um, before I stop this lecture, I just want to point out the fact that the phenotypic ratio, right? The, the three to one ratio, remember it's three fourths to one fourth. This phenotype ratio is different than the genotype ratio. This genotype ratio is uh, one fourth to one half. Let's be consistent. One fourth to two fourths to one fourth. So it's a one to two to one ratio, right? One to two to one versus a three to one ratio. And so when I ask you stuff on the exam, or, or even the problem sets, make sure that you're paying attention, right? There's a vast difference between me asking you a phenotypic ratio and a genotypic ratio. And you got to keep those straight. All right. So we can, I know I said I wasn't going to stop, but I'm not going to. So we can predict inheritance by using the Punnett square, right? We can tell uh, what the genotype of an organism is just by doing something called a test cross. So let's, I'll give you an example. So let's say that you're going to buy a horse, right? It's a thoroughbred horse, but you don't know what its genetics are because this is the 1950s and DNA was just discovered. So you are going to have to figure it out if you're, that horse is worth $10 million or not. Um, same thing with plants. So let's say that we're just going to do the the simple genetics of a pea plant and the color of its genes. So if I told you that I have a purple flowered plant, right? And I'm holding it in front of your face and I say, this is a true breeding purebred plant then you would say, okay, it must be homozygous dominant, right? Big P, big P. But how would you know? Because really, if it was a heterozygote, you couldn't tell. They both are the same color purple. So how do you tell one from the other? And it's simple. You cross it to something you do know. What's the only colored flower that you do know in Mendel's world? White. So we cross these to white, And we're going to get vastly different outcomes. So if it's if it's true breeding, like you told me it was, and I crossed it to white, let's distinguish these. Then every one of these would be heterozygous, right? And so when I looked at all the offspring, they would all be purple, right? And I'd be like, okay. I trust you. This horse is true breeding. I will pay you $10 million for it. That flower is 100% uh, true breeding. Uh, and, you know, I'll pay this dog is true breeding. I will pay you whatever, you know, ridiculous $5,000 for a French bulldog or whatever it costs now. Um, but if you, if it wasn't, if it's not true breeding and you crossed it, Right, you would expect, and you can do the, the Punnett square, that half, 
have. So two out of four, two out of four, right? These two would be purple. And two out of four, these two out of four would be white. So you would know if you had any white offspring that you're blowing smoke and there's no way that that is a true breeding, pure breeding organism. So that is what we call a test cross. Um, we can do that. So when I was lecturing earlier about for genetics, generally because we have so much information nowadays on genetics, we do what's called reverse genetics. So we can look at the mutation in the DNA and figure out what trait is involved in that, which is pretty cool considering that we didn't even really know what that DNA was our genetic material uh, until after we had built an atomic bomb. All right, so I'm going to stop here because uh, independent assortment has to do with two traits, and I just want to keep it to a single trait at this point. So I'm going to stop the lecture now. I'll post this, and then tomorrow I will make I will continue this lecture, and we'll finish up the independent assortment with multiple crosses. This is called a dihybrid cross because it's actually two traits. In this case, uh, the example is P color, so it's yellow, big Y, big Y is true breeding yellow, little Y, little Y, keeping with Mendel's thing is, um, so big Y, big Y is yellow, right, because that's the dominant, and then little Y, little Y would be green, because that's recessive, right, we're keeping with the same capital letter of the first letter of the dominant trait. And then again, we have big R, big R, which, oh, you guessed it, uh, round is dominant. And then little r, little r would be wrinkled. So now we have two genes. We have seed color and we have seed shape. Oops. Shape. All right. <coughs> And that's where it gets vastly more complicated, and then we get into independent assortment uh, in Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment. So we'll pick that up next time. Have a good night. Um, thanks for watching. Where is my cursor? Is it gone? Please.